Hello and welcome to this video. In this video we're going to go through um, two more types of interactions that can occur um, but we're looking at the interactions of annihilation and pair production. So we're going to go into a more of a, a conceptual mindset for this um, since they get, it gets pretty hard to, to understand why this happens. Um, this is down to some uh, quite high level Einstein uh, physics. So the first thing I want to introduce is uh, the idea of uh, just make sure we're good with the idea of antiparticles and also the, with the idea of mass energy. So if you remember um, when we looked at antiparticles, we said briefly that um, all of their quantum values, uh, so all quantum values are opposites. Right, and that's except mass. Okay, because it, we can't have um, negative mass essentially. If we've, if we've got something, it weighs some mass. If we flip it, it can't have like a negative mass. And so we have to say all of its quantum values, so its charge will flip, um, its momentum will flip, um, it's barrier number, lepton number, spin, all of these things will change, uh, even strangeness if it's not a weak interaction, um, but mass will stay the same. But this mass has a, um, a weird thing, which was discovered by Einstein when he was doing his theory of special relativity, and that is the idea of mass energy. So I'm sure, um, a lot of you will have, well, basically all of you will have heard this expression that E is equal to mc squared. But not many people actually know what that means. Um, and this basically means, so E means energy, m is the mass, and c is the speed of light. Okay, so, and what this basically says is that if you take the mass of an object in kilograms and you multiply it by the speed of light squared, you get the equivalent energy to that mass, which essentially means that E equals mc squared states that energy and mass are interchangeable. Interchangeable states. Okay. This means that if I start with just pure energy, I can spontaneously create mass. And if I start with pure mass, I can annihilate them and create pure energy. Okay. And um, this mass energy, everything that exists with mass has mass energy. And there's a table on your formula sheet. Um, so your formula sheet, if you go to the second page, um, you have a table of all of the different types of particles that you have to know and all of their mass energies. The thing about the mass energy that you're given is that it's given in mega electron volts. So you need to know how to convert from mega electron volts or just electron volts to um, uh, joules because that's what you will want to do most of your calculations in. And the idea is mega so this mega means 10 to the 6, and 1 electron volt is the same as 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Okay, this is something you're going to have to know. This is a memorization uh, thing. And you'll probably recognize this number. And this is because the way we define an electron volt is it's the amount of energy um, that uh, so let's write this down. So one electron volt is the amount of energy required or gained um, when an electron <clears throat> is accelerated through a one volt potential. Okay, so if you haven't uh, looked over the, um, <clears throat> if you haven't looked over the electricity topic yet, this probably uh, won't make much sense. 
Um, but essentially, if you take an electron and you put it through a potential of one volt, it will gain one electron volt worth of energy. And so we, what the E stands for is basically just the, the charge of the electron, and the V is the voltage, so that corresponds to one times 1 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So this is how we define the electron volt scale. So you need to know how to convert between these two, but there is a list of all of the um, mass energies of all of the particles that we have to know uh, on the second page of your formula sheet. Okay, now that we've cleared this up, let's just take a look at um, what I mean by annihilation and what I mean by pair production. Okay, so annihilation is proof of the idea that E equals mc squared. It's proof that the idea that energy and mass are interchangeable states because what happens in annihilation is if we take, um, let's take an electron, for example, and then somewhere there's a positron and this positron is going to come um, close to this electron. It's positive and negatively charged, so they're going to attract each other, right? So this is going to start accelerating this way. This is going to start accelerating this way. And when they... Um, when they're traveling towards each other, they're basically building up potential energy because the closer and closer they get, the more potential they have to touch. As soon as they touch, all of that potential energy has to go somewhere. And what actually happens is because these are antiparticles of each other, when they touch, they annihilate. And so what happens is we have a massive explosion and we get two photons given out. So there's a photon, which I'm going to draw like this. And there's two photons emitted in opposite directions. Okay, so the description of annihilation is that we have um, a particle uh, antiparticle collision. And the particle anti particle antiparticle uh, collision um, uh, all mass energy is uh, given off as two photons traveling in opposite directions. Okay, so this is how we would explain what annihilation is. We've taken particle and an antiparticle, we um, they collide, they give off two uh, photons, they have to travel in opposite directions. You might say, why do they have to travel in opposite directions? And they do this to conserve momentum. Okay, because even though um, we're not conserving mass, we are still conserving energy. Um, so when people say the mass has to stay the same in all uh, things, doesn't. We can get mass turning to energy, we can get energy turning to mass. Um, but even if we have a photon that doesn't have mass because it's moving, it will still have momentum. This is a quantum mechanics idea that we're going to look at in uh, a few videos time. But this can happen between any particle antiparticle pair. This could have been a proton with an antiproton. Um, this could have been, um, would technically happen with a, a neutron, a neutron and an antineutron, although that would make things a bit difficult since things aren't charged. Um, but overall, this is your annihilation reaction. One thing that is key is that the energy that's given out, so the energy of photons, so these photons are usually gamma rays. So let me write that down. So energy of the photons is usually in the gamma section of the, um, the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, it has to be at least uh, the mass energy of both uh, the electron and positron. Okay, because even if thing, these things are stationary and they touch each other, they'll still have the potential energy. So all of that potential energy has to go into those photons. Um, any excess energy will go over onto the photons as well. So if you had them moving at um, like 
hundreds of thousands of meters per second, and then they collide, all of that excess kinetic energy is also going to be traveled as a, as a photon. This is more important when we look at um, pair production, so when we're doing the opposite of this. Um, but it is important to know that the energy has to be conserved, as in everything. Okay, so now let's look at um, the idea of pair production. So um, if we've got annihilation, annihilation is essentially going from, um, from mass to energy. This is going from energy to mass. So if we have an, a photon, which I'm going to draw like this, uh, this photon um, can spontaneously, as long as it has sufficient energy, can spontaneously just form an electron and a positron pair. Depending on the energy, it could also form a proton, an antiproton pair. It could form a neutron, antineutron pair. Um, uh, but all of these things are dependent on the energy of this. So a verbal description of what this is, is a, a photon with sufficient energy, sufficient energy, um, spontaneously creates a particle antiparticle pair. Okay, and that's what's that's what's happening here. This word sufficient energy, how do we calculate what the sufficient energy of this thing is? Well, the energy of the photon must be at least the combined mass energy of the proton, of the um, electron and positron. The electron and positron. Okay, this is, um, this is how we can know if this photon has sufficient energy. Um, this is obviously specific to this case. If it was, um, if it was trying to create a proton, antiproton, it would need loads more energy um, because it has loads, uh, a much higher mass energy. Um, but in this case, we can actually do a calculation with this, and it's possible they can ask you in the exam, um, given uh, that a photon spontaneously creates an electron and a positron, what is the minimum energy that that photon must have been in the first place? And so what we're going to do is use um, the formula sheet. So we would say, um, so let's say, how do we calculate the energy of the photon? If we look at the formula sheet, you'll see the mass energy, the mass energy of uh, the electron is 0 0.510999. Uh, there's more nines, but I'm just going to stick with this mega electron volts. Okay, this is the mass energy that's given to you in the formula sheet. You don't have to remember this. And so, um, what we can do from this is basically just say, okay, this is the mass energy of an electron. I know the mass of the positron isn't different from the mass of the electron. So the mass energy isn't different either, which means that I can basically just double this to get the total amount of energy. So if I times this by two, that's the energy from um, the electron and the positron combined. And that is equal to, um, that is equal to 1.02 um, mega electron volts. I'm just rounding this to three significant figures. Then this is going to be times 10 to the 6. So this becomes 1.02 times 10 to the 6 electron volts. Now, if you remember from earlier, uh, one electron volt is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. So if I want to get from 1 to 1 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, I have to multiply by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. So I'm going to do that here. I'm going to take 1.02 times 10 to the 6, uh, multiply by 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. 
and this is going to give me my answer in joules, which is 1.64. times 10 to the minus 13 joules okay and so now um, just using the data that we're given you can calculate that the absolute minimum energy that this photon has to have in order for this pair production to happen is going to be 1.64 times 10 to the minus 13 joules what you might say then is what happens if you get more energy than that but not enough energy to maybe do it a different one and essentially all your excess energy is going to be kinetic energy. Okay, so as soon as these things are created, any leftover energy that that photon has is going to be pushed onto these things as kinetic energy so that they push away from each other. Um, again, the, the keen eye amongst you might notice that if we've got a pair production and then we're releasing an electron and, a, and an anti-electron or a positron and they're close together, they're probably going to go back and annihilate each other okay which you would be right most um, times we have this pair production is followed by annihilation pretty quickly um, but um, they are pretty useful for uh, uh, many things for example uh, mostly annihilation is useful um, if you ever had a PET scan uh, PET scans use annihilation and they are positron emitters, so they'll emit a positron into, um, they basically label a drug with a positron emitter. That emits positrons into your um, bloodstream. The bloodstream then obviously is a glucose-based thing, gets absorbed by a tissue that has the most metabolic activity. You'll get loads of annihilation happening in there, which means you get loads of gamma rays given out um, not a harmful amount, it's not uh, that high dosage of radiation, um, and they can be detected, and that can help you to narrow down where maybe a, a cancer is in your body. So they are pretty useful um, techniques that we can use uh, in everyday life. Thank you for watching.